Am I talking? Okay. Um, hello. Sorry for the technical problems. Uh, so yeah, I just posted online to see what people would like for me to talk about tonight. Um, Justin has got a few questions. Uh, you know, this, this is kind of an interesting way to start. Um, but news providers, who are my favorite art news providers? Uh, I, you know, I read very little of, uh, of, of things that are on new websites. Um, most of the information. So, so one of the things that I'm, I'm really proud of with our books is that I'm able to put stories in there that, uh, that you don't see regurgitated. So something that happens a lot, it's like the game of telephone where a story gets told and then told again and told again. And then by the second, third time, perhaps there's a deviation in the language and it starts to get to the point where by the fifth or sixth time you've got an incorrect statement. I noticed that a lot when I was doing the Mukha Le Pater book, that there were anecdotes that when I read them in Mukha's son's book, that I could see how a deviation had occurred. I can't think of any specific instances, but I just remember thinking, oh, this is the real thing. Also, a lot of times I'll see um, attributions, like for example, something being in a book or a magazine article. And I can't tell you how many times, it's numerous, where I'll then go look for that magazine and it's not the right magazine. And I'll look and it's like, maybe the thing says, you know, that it's 1902 in the February issue of, of something and you look and then it's 1903. And so the thing keeps getting repeated and it's the wrong year. And so a good example is I have these bound volumes of Deutsche Kunst and decoration. So it's, it's German books. And of course there's great graphics in it, but a lot of the uh, information that I'll find relating to, like in this case, it's porcelain. Um, I just think it's really important to go back to the source. So even if I see something attributed, uh, I do look for the old periodical. And so many of these are digitized now that, you know, I have walls filled with magazines and books from the turn of the century, but you don't really need that anymore to do great research. Um, you know, you just need basically a digital library card. Uh, so the research is much easier. And then the thing that really, where I feel like I learned the most is, is and I, I grabbed these, Justin, because of our quick conversation, um, are these old books, like this one, Bohemian Paris of today. And so the thing that happens when you look at these is I think about like if I'm talking to someone right now about something that happened in a recording studio in 2010, the information is very fresh. <clears throat> and if you're reading like the 33 and a third uh, book series where they talk about, you know, the recording of Starfish by the church or something, well, the people that are relating these stories were there. It's the producer, it's the musicians, it's uh, a and R people. And so getting things that are kind of within that 30 year window, especially uh, is, is the, is the way to get legitimate eyewitness accounts. And so what I did is I grabbed three books that were ones that are really, really seminal to me. Um, and I'll go kind of in order chronologically of what they're talking about. This one is the, is the most recently printed. This book is from, it's from 1969. So it's, it's, it's very late compared to what it's talking about. It's about 75 years after the fact, but, uh, Philippe Julian, Julian, 
He's French, I don't know how to pronounce it. Uh, Dreamers of Decadence. If you do not have this book and you have any interest whatsoever, I'm trying to get the glare, in symbolist art, uh, this is the Bible. This is one that you have to have. And so this is kind of the entry point. Um, if you're looking at Gustave Moreau and uh, Fernand Knopf and Odilon Redan and even Walter Prane and Beardsley and the people that are kind of a little tangential with it. Um, of course, there's the Jean Delvaux piece that's, that's on the cover. Um, this is where I first heard of Rupert Carabin statues. This is where I first heard of uh, kind of the Wagnerian connection. The, the kind, I mean, you know, obviously I knew of the connection to symbolist art and opera and the, the way that the visuals and the romance of the story tied in together. But this gave me um, just an insane amount of data. And his writing style is really engaging. I, I'm sure he was a big influence on me. I love that his author photo is, you know, this pink sky in the graveyard, the very, very creepy goth nerd. Um, but so with this particular book, like, let me see if I can find uh, a nice, uh, you can see I've got bookmarked Satan's Treasures with Jean Delville. Um, let me see if I can find, oh, this is interesting, a little Baphomet thing. Uh, I'm trying to find something that would be interesting to read as a quick, uh, You know, I clearly didn't prepare in this way. <laughs> so I'm just going to, I'll open up toward a random thing and read a paragraph. We'll see how it goes. Um, another pre-Raphaelite, Holman Hunt, who was much more austere than Rossetti and not at all a sensualist, had settled in Jerusalem in order to get closer to biblical truth. So they're talking about some of these kind of... Uh, religiously leaning allegorical symbolist that's an alive and better painting. Um, Holman Hunt, not at all a sensualist, had settled in Jerusalem in order to get closer to biblical truth. Even Tissot, later on the fashionable painter of actresses and coquettes, had taken refuge in mysticism after an unhappy love affair, as many of us do. And after deciding to illustrate the Bible, also traveled to Judea. Finally, Ari Renan, one of Moreau's favorite pupils, painted Les Fils de Jepte, I don't know who that name is, for the 1886 Salon. Um, Jules Lefort gave this impression of the picture. The daughters walking in procession draped in blue with an epic gaze in their eyes and fatalistic attitudes. It is motionless, mysterious, and immortally precious in a little corner of the future. So that's just one paragraph. That may not seem super interesting out of context, but a good example is, you know, when they talk about a critic talking about something, well, then I would look through databases. Well, who's this critic? Who did he write for? Where's the full article of him talking about this salon? Um, artists that I do know, like I don't know Ari Renan, one of Moreau's favorite pupils. If he was one of Gustav Moreau's favorite pupils, I feel like I need to know who this person is. Um, so that's 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 why I go to a book like this way more than something on the internet. So that's number one. Um, number two, one of my favorite, favorite, favorite books. Um, Gail Pataki gave me this, I believe. And I think it was because she just, <laughs> I think there's no pictures. <laughs> I think she was like, I'm not going to read it. Uh, and this one, uh, it's kind of misleading. The title, uh, Toulouse the Track, you would think this is a book about Toulouse the Track. It is not a book about Toulouse the Track. It is a book all about the bars, restaurants, and cabarets in Paris in the 1880s and 1890s. And they're talking about it in the context of like the world of Toulouse Trek. Um, but the thing for me that I did is I would see a poster for 
uh, you know, let me grab like the cafe concerts. I, I would see one for the Divan Japonais. You know, of course, there's the famous Lautrec poster. Um, and then this book was written in the 60s, I think, 1953. So again, it's in that window. It's like, you know, he, he, she, he, Gerstel, sorry, uh, was able to speak to people who were in these places. Um, and so when you get an anecdote about one of the nightclubs or um, a performer, if they're talking about Aristide Bruant or a Sarah Bernhardt type or someone like that, um, you're getting, it's really firsthand at this point. And so going back to this kind of origin point, the only other thing you can do is go back to the turn of century, turn of the century material. But this to me is really accessible. I just randomly opened up to this. So the Moulin de la, de la Galette, Moulin de la Galette, sorry. Uh, it's a poster I'm familiar with. I think it's a Rodel and I think it's uh, one of the Maitre de la Fiche. But you just opened that. Of the two dozen or more ancient windmills that once adorned the slopes of Montmartre, only one survives today, the Moulin de la Galette. De la Galette. I'm tripping over that. Perched near the summit of the hill at 79 Rue La Pic, at the top of the steep Rue Chalose, its wooden tower and spreading gray wings dominate the entire city. The old mill is no longer as conspicuous, however, as it was in Lautrec's time. The hillside, then only sparsely dotted with low houses surrounded by large gardens and vineyards, is now thickly settled, and the Moulin de la Galette is partly hidden behind tall apartment buildings. But the view over Paris from the terraced garden is still magnificent. And then he talks about uh, the day, and he talks about the performers. There's Moulin Rouge. Uh, there's chapters on each of the cafe concerts. Uh, Lautrec's friends. I mean, there's a lot of super interesting stuff in here. I'm not going to read to you the whole time, but this is probably like a $5 book. If you look on the used book sites, uh, like, I don't know, whichever ones you use, um, Toulouse Lautrec by Gerstel Mack, uh, author of Paul Cezanne, which I'm embarrassed to say I didn't buy. I should, because there's probably some great historical stuff in here. Um, but if you just open up into a couple pages in here and dive into it, uh, there's so many stories that are in here that because they're not going to propagate over the internet, you're getting that eyewitness account. Um, and just as fascinating a story as whatever Klimt story they're kind of, uh, you know, again, propagating on thousands of websites, um, if not more so. And then this one is probably my most favorite of the stack. Or did I say that already about another book? I don't know. I think Chandra's yelling, yeah, you did. Well, these, I mean, these are three of my favorite, favorite, favorite books. So this is from 1934. So a little later, but the time that it applies to is, is uh, relevant chronologically to the publication. This is talking about the 1920s. Um, and I'll just give you a, you know, when I, when I opened up, I was, uh, he talks about like here, it's, it's Sinful Cities of the Western World by Henrik DeLeo. And he talks about, um, he's basically like a pleasure traveler. And so he's talking about nightclubs in Berlin, which is why I originally was attracted to this. Uh, I did see it mentioned in uh, Voluptuous Panic by Mel Gordon. That's how I came to this book. Uh, but just here's like just a random thing. Uh, I mean, just a weird, here's, this is under the roof of the cafe, which sheltered me from the Moorish sun, a variegated company was engaged in drinking. My Arab guide in true Moorish character had gone to sleep trusting to fate feeling that at some time of day I would be ready to start my expedition into the bowels of Tangier. Goats were wandering in the street and even strayed into the small hotel garden. 
At a corner facing a native restaurant, I saw a man being bled by a barber for congestion. This seemed a most useful remedy as it was explained to me later, simple as can be when properly done and doing no harm whatsoever to the victim. And then he keep describes making the incision in the neck, all of that. Um, let me find the, some of the German. But I opened this earlier and I laughed because it was like, I mean, it's, it's, there's a lot of sex in here. <laughs> the little dove began to disrobe. This did not take long as, like many of her Western sisters in that particular trade, she wore absolutely nothing under her frock. <laughs> Uh, so again, the guy's a pleasure seeker, New York, Berlin, uh, here. Wow. Okay. All roads lead to Hitler, Chandra. Uh, for in Berlin alone, where I was the guest of a German newspaper man who, if his name were known to the Nazis, would follow the rest of the courageous to the executioner's playground. I learned on unimpeachable authority that there are over 45,000 homosexual youths and men many of whom belong to the highest in Nazi ranks. The increase, this increase in homosexuality rampant among the rank and file of the Fuhrer's brown and black shirts is mainly due to the Nazi culture characteristics. And besides, there are in Berlin numerous places where the morphine addict and the opium smoker can indulge in their favorite vices, places sponsored by Goring, who is known as one of the most particular morphine addicts Berlin harbors. Blah, 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 blah. He goes on. But so the point is, um, you know, when you're looking at something like A Voluptuous Panic by Mel Gordon, again, another book you should have, or you're reading the books that I write, this is one of the places where I find a lot of the information. Um, and you can start to get a sense, especially if you read reviews of the day. Um, and if you start to read multiple books, you can kind of get a feel for when someone is just being sensationalist, um, like the things he was mentioning about homosexuality and drug use, these are things that we do know today. Historically, uh, Hitler was, was, was patient number one. Um, God, there's a book I mentioned the other day that talks about the amphetamine uh, use in Germany amongst the soldiers. Um, but yeah, you know, so those, so that is, uh, more so where I'm going to go. Um, and even though I've read books like this before, like I probably haven't picked up dreamers of decadence in 20 years. So now that it's out, I'll sit and read that for half an hour, uh, when we're done here today. Um, you know, this is another one just kind of as a fourth, I wouldn't say this is one of my favorites in the way these other three are, but they talk about when you see the famous images of like the Tavern La Enfer, um, where it's the mouth of the devil that you walk through, this is where you can read about what happens there. Um, one of the stories I remember is like in the, in the heaven side of it, there was a, a window up top that would open and then these performers would come out and there was like a little trolley thing that went around. I have to reread this to refresh my memory, but the way that I learned the stories of what happened in these clubs uh, that then I put in, like if you're like, how does he know these weird little anecdotes that are in all these books? That's how uh, I read these old books. I, I find the old magazines as much of this material as I have. I love finding the old um, turn of the century magazines. Uh, Brandon, can you grab me? There's a couple of Yugen magazines right over there, actually. Could you, what I see from here? Just any one of them is fine. I just was going to hold it up as an example. Thank you, Brandon. You know, here's an example of like, you know, you just find, here's a Yugen magazine from 1896 and another one from 1897. But I, you know, old periodicals are the best the old ads, uh, the old poems. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's definitely, to me, that stuff is priceless when you're uh, trying to learn not just the data about the period, but also the vibe. Like when you start reading the periodicals, you, you see what kind of jokes people were making. Um, 
the Berlin Girls series that we did, one of the things that was really interesting to me was that I understood what was happening politically and sociologically. And the things that I had read academically are talking about the starvation, you're reading about the black markets. But then I'm reading these magazines and it's all women that look super put together and going out with men with top hats and canes. And I'm thinking like, well, what a weird juxtaposition. And it kind of has a little bit of a bread and circus feel where everything was really terrible. And so these periodicals were kind of trying to keep things light. It's entertainment culture. And that's, you know, so of course we, when I say that out loud, you think, well, of course it would be that. Like, what are they going to do? Sit around and like watch German expressionist films and like <laughs> lament their life, like all like, and then go home to like sleep on a stone floor with like broth made of, I don't know, dog hair or something. Like I just, it, it's not, uh, it's not a complete picture. And so the more things that you take in, then kind of the bigger view. And the reason why I focus on like 1880 to 1930 so much is because you can keep circling on these eras and learning more and more and more. And I feel like it's already a really wide area. And I don't want to know about 200 years or a thousand years um, lightly. I really want to kind of understand the marrow of these periods in terms of the emotional sentiments and the romantic and spiritual sentiments. You know, you read the religious tracts and then you read some of the metaphysical writing and you know, in the same way that people now, like all the conspiracy theory stuff being so rampant, but then you connect that to the lack of spirituality and then you compare it to the fact that, okay, conspiracy theories were always there, but now because of the internet, the guy that's the 64 year old man who works at the grocery store is exposed to crazy stories in a way that he wouldn't have been perhaps in previous decades. Um, so yeah, it's just a lot of information that, that you kind of process, uh, to try to get a, a sensitivity to things that's, that's just not like a textbook sensitivity. It's, it's as close to time, time travel as we can get. Um, did you say victim? What are we talking about? Where did I get this piano? Hi, Troy. Uh, this piano was in the World's Fair in Paris in 1900. It, there's a gold medal inside from uh, Belgium from 1905. Um, it's an Art Nouveau piano. I bought it at uh, some auction like 20 something years ago, a long time ago. <clears throat> um, but it's beautiful. It's a fruit wood, so it sounds really pretty. I don't know if it would. Uh, I don't know if it would translate. But you know what? Since I don't know what I'm going to talk about, we'll uh, we'll find out. <laughs> Let's find out. I'll. Uh, now it's a show. I'll play for a minute. Let's see. Can you speak on any artists that may have been directly inspired with the seance culture during the Weimar Republic? Um, Troy, I can't believe I played piano in front of you. Troy did the music for Caligula. Um, you know, all of, all of the, uh, less so in the 20s, the artists that really, really got influenced by automatic writing, spirituality, a lot of things like that, at least in Europe, you see a lot of it around the late 19th century. I think a lot of Americans by the thirties were getting influenced by, I feel like you see more of it in America in the thirties and more of it in Europe in the 1890s when I'm thinking of the more kind of prominent names. I think that so during the Weimar Republic, um, You know, 
after the Industrial Revolution, people had telescopes, they had microscopes, and so they started really looking at things beyond human vision. And because of that, they started then thinking about spirituality and metaphysics more than they did before. What happened in the Weimar Republic is you had World War I and, and Germany was just decimated and the population was so demoralized that they were worried about how they were going to get a piece of sausage for their family that night. So there was a lot less uh, interest in the metaphysics at that time in a way that I would say kind of casually crept into the culture. And what I mean by that is like, so if you look at it, the reason there's so much metaphysical art in the 1890s and around 1900, because everybody was well fed. And so the idea of kind of sitting back and saying, well, what is this? What could this be? What else is there? It became so luxurious that it really permeated the culture. The thing I feel like I see most strongly happening in the Weimar era is that people were the artists. I mean, let me put it this way. I'll rephrase this. I started to talk about culturally with the people, but I'm going to say this about the artists. So the artists were in the war and they learned how to draw really well. And then they watched the horrors of war. And I never understood expressionism until I saw a documentary that then showed this drawing of these really aggressive, just harsh lines. And it showed the, the artist, I can't remember who it was, but it showed their very academic work from before they went to war and then what they drew when they came back. And it was obvious that the beautiful delicacy of, oh, I'm drawing this field didn't work. It was, it was the bold lines. It was the aggressive, huge strokes of, of, um, you know, almost creating a sense of velocity on the page. And so the thing that artists in the Weimar area were really tuned into was how messed up, I'm trying not to swear, how messed up their culture was at that time. There's a great book called Lust Mord. It's, it's a, it's a little bit of a hard read, but it's very, very, very interesting. Uh, and it talks about that there were more canvases drawn, like I don't, hundreds of canvases were drawn with the title Lustborn, which means sexual murder. And from what I understand, there were more serial killers in Germany between 1919 and 1923 than like any time anywhere in the world in history. And so when you take the fact that, that people were living in a culture that was so deeply entrenched in this kind of emotionally broken uh, valley following the war, mixed with uh, this hypersensualization where they were converging sexuality and, and, and violence um, and the rampant, rampant drug use. You had people like Anita Berber that were, uh, you know, publicly walking around with brooches of, of cocaine, brooches filled with cocaine. And, you know, she would dip flower petals in ether and eat them. Like it was a very, very decadent time in terms of drug use, sex, um, use of, of sex as, as currency. Um, I have a, a big collection of police blotters from the era. It was a very, very, uh, not just violent era, but it was being covered in the newspapers in a different way. So you just don't see in the gestalt of the country that people were drawing, um, you know, pictures kind of imagining what might be beyond the veil. Uh, I will put an asterisk on that. The one place where you do see it is in the magazine De Orchidine Garden. We did a series of books called you know, they're based on the Orchid Garden magazines. And you do see some of it creep in there. And so I don't mean to say that there aren't artists that, that were pursuing that, but it was just a lot darker 
uh, you see a lot of occultism coming in visually. Like, for example, look at Metropolis. Metropolis is all full of occult symbolism. When you look at just the ideas of some of the, the early German films, like the student of Prague and things like that, there's lots and lots of metaphysical ideas, but it was less the parlor tricks of a seance and then kind of playing out to, um, you know, just kind of a general spooky aesthetic. Um, it got really dark and really serious really quickly. So, you know, as I'm saying that, of course, there's, there's pictures, you know, you had theaters and you had people kind of in niche places in the arts that were leaning heavily into the occult imagery. Um, but it's almost like the occult imagery was either secondary or the sentiment of it was much deeper. Whereas the turn of the century was kind of like the middle ground, meaning it was very visually omnipresent. But aside from artists like Fidus and stuff, they may or may not have been thinking seriously about it. Um, it was a little more armchair. And I think that in the Weimar era, it was just things were so rough in so many ways that that's, there's just not an easy answer. I shouldn't say that. I'm sure that could be an easy answer, uh, but I'm giving you a thoughtful answer because I respect and appreciate you. Um, but yeah, man, it's cool stuff. The, the stuff, I love the Weimar era art. I really love the cabaret art probably most. And I think that um, when you're thinking about occult art through the 20s, you're thinking about things like seance culture or you know, the people that were doing automatic writing and stuff. So one of the things that happened is the reason it starts in Europe and moves to America is a great example is you had all of the nature movement, like vegetarianism, stuff like that, starting in Germany, moving to California right at the turn of the century. Um, and in the same way, you had the things happening in Paris, especially that were very occult themed, that then, did, that then did migrate to America. And so it is just kind of like the natural couple of decades uh, trailing um, in terms of the way art movements kind of go, you know, where things move around the country. Um, it seems anecdotally that both blah, 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 classical. Forrest asks about the classical and medieval tropes and imagery. You know, I was trying to write about Grasse last night. I was doing the final pass on the edit for Beautiful Macabre. And um, I was actually thinking about this. So, so Eugene Grasse, uh, I was trying to describe his work. And it's very rooted in this idea of medieval classicism. And of course, it's modernized because of the floral and, you know, enlargements and, and things like that. And I think, I think that the, the two things that really, that I just kind of came to is you've got the arts and crafts movement, number one. So you've got that whole William Morris thing happening where they were looking at medieval line work, these kinds of things, and trying to just bring it back in a slightly modernized way. And then I think even for the people that might not have been directly influenced by that, there is still um, and I, I say this like if you move out of England and you are in France, when Grasset was everywhere, but um, when you're thinking about nature and you're thinking about kind of a classical history, you can have like the pre-society visuals of someone like a Fidus, who I've mentioned a couple times tonight. Um, but in terms of like organized society, that is kind of like the golden age, isn't it? You know, like that's the, that's the time when, and not, you know, certainly it didn't smell idyllic, I'm sure. But when you think about like, oh, and she's dressed in her Renfair gown and the man has the feather in his cap and there's a knight or, you know, whatever things that they were doing, like it's just, when you think visually, to kind of the earliest idyllic recorded visual images, the most modern connection to like, the most, uh, what's the word? 
the connection that we have to an art that is most visibly modern to our aesthetic is going to be that kind of Renaissance art. Um, so I think it's those two things. I think it's that idyllic element of, you know, kind of the fantasy element. And then it's also just the fact that with William Morris, with the British arts and crafts, that that was so uh, omnipresent and respected at that time. Um, Troy, it's a Weimar era is fascinating time period for your art and music, a mashup of styles, influence, blah, 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 blah. Uh, and of course, he's got to go to World War II kraut rock. Uh, I'm not uh, educated in that, so I don't know. I, uh, I stop around 1930, and I don't pick up again until the 80s, so we'll see, unless it's Frank Sinatra. But uh, does, uh, was in your reading about operation, some of these I don't know. Chandra, do you have anything for me? Uh, Cassimer has a question for our comment. Who? Cassimer. I can't hear you. I am so sorry. Oh, Kasma. I'm sorry. It's right there. I had not seen that comment a moment ago, and I couldn't hear her. You mentioned focusing on the time 1880 to 1930. That is very close to the time span of the British Raj. What did the iconography of India have throughout European art at that time? I don't know. I really don't know. The only things that I've seen are things that probably would be in a category that would be most accurately uh, defined as questionable um, in its relationship to racism. And I say that in the sense of when I think about like Walter Crane illustrating someone that is of Indian descent or of art that looks like that. Or I think about like a Walter Schnockenberg costume design that kind of has an Indian look. There's a couple I can think of. Like they're, you know, they're cliches. They're very, um... <clears throat> so I think that the artists in the areas like France and Germany and Italy that I'm aware of were aware of those aesthetics. And it's kind of the equivalent of Ricardo Montalban playing a Native American on the Rifleman or something like it's a very two dimensional, um, you know, uh, coached perspective uh, of, of, of what those things are. Uh, so I'm sorry, I don't have an answer for that. I really don't know. I, I don't know. One of, so one of, I will say this one of the things that happens with influences because a lot of it has to do with exhibitions. Like for example, Clement Massier and Gallet were looking at the uh, World Exposition in 1889. And they saw the shards of Isnic glass uh, and, and you know, Roman, vessels that had achieved centuries of iridescence because of some of the oxidation of, of the patinas and things like that. That's what inspired them to start making their iridescent patinas. They were trying to, to capture these things. I think anecdotally they were finding shards on the beach as well, but I know that, you know, one of the reasons the secession movement happened, I want to I'm going on a million points here, the first point is that when you have exhibitions, whether it's art from Japan or from other areas, I think about this, like, I think it's Paul Ranson that did an illustration of a tiger. Um, and it was because he saw some exhibition of Japanese art and then all of these Frenchmen looked at this exhibition, started doing it. I think that was the 1889 thing I'm talking about. But so then you have where an exhibition will happen and it opens up people's minds to these different aesthetics. So the reason that you have um, all of these artists that are influenced in Japanism is that because trade had opened with Japan, you had all of this paper 
coming in that was being used to wrap. You had museum exhibitions happening. The artists were exposed to it. And so with the secession movements, what that was an attempt to do is you had, first of all, in, in Munich, you had artists wanting to galvanize their community, but also to be exposed to art from other territories. There was a, you had the Munich secession, you had Vienna secession, you had the Berlin secession. There was a secession organization in Prague that was a Manes, I'm going to mispronounce it, M-A-N-E-S exhibition. Um, there was a secession movement in Japan in one of the art and decorations. I was reading about the Japanese secession. And it was kind of a reverse thing. These Japanese artists that wanted to see what the French were doing, what the Italians and, and British were doing. And so it is really interesting to me that I don't see, you do see some like, for example, in Holland, they had things coming over from the Javanese colonies, but I don't really see anything with India coming back um, unless it's places like Bing and the way that some of that might have crept into some of Mooka's work. Um, but it seems so watered down. So I don't know. I'm thinking out loud as I'm thinking about this, but um, because of recent cancel culture, have you found it more difficult to do your research? Troy, you know full I don't leave the house. Uh, I spent a lot of time with my books, three dogs, uh, and a piano. And so I don't, to answer your question directly, the answer is no. Um, you know, everything is like everything everywhere all at once, you know, like all the information's online, there's all the books, there's all these things. And I think that at least kind of in academic circles, there's, um, I think if you're studying Weimar Germany and 19th century mysticism and, and things like that, there's, there's kind of a lack of, um, a lack of, uh, sensitivity around ideas that are in antithesis to your own. And I say that because like I was talking tonight with my son about mouse and it's like, I can read about Nazi Germany and not think, wow, it would be great to be a Nazi. It's not, uh, these thoughts aren't invasive. They're cautionary. And so, um, I think that the idea that things can't be spoken about is obviously dangerous. And I think that when it comes to history, um, it's, it's, it's been rare for me to run into someone with any kind of legitimate interest in history um, that isn't willing to have a discussion or share information. And they'll be vocal about opinions, uh, which is fine. But, you know, the data is the data. I did have someone the other day. I don't want to um, give it away in case by some chance this person is listening. But someone was mentioning something about some art that they found problematic. And it was uh, very surprising to me that someone um, in an academic setting would look at something um, through that lens. I mean, I guess to, to not be too vague about, I guess I just got to say it. They were offended by mermaids. <laughs> They said, I find mermaids problematic. And I was like, man, that's a lot to unpack. Uh, like I didn't engage with it. I'm watching this conversation happen. And I thought, you know, she said something like, yes, yeah, she doesn't even deserve a lower half to her body. Is that the message you're sending? And I was almost like, is this person trolling? It's like, no, dead serious. She's offended by mermaids. Um, but 
that's the only one I can think of. So while I do occasionally find, and again, too, like, I mean, that's, that's your sentiment. That's your feeling. It doesn't harm me. And that is one of those things of like on the internet, uh, do you have anything constructive to add? And if the answer is no, then you should keep scrolling. So, uh, you know, I don't, I don't agree with her. I'm also not a woman. So I don't know, like if, if there's lots of women that are going to say, you know, I'm glad someone brought this up because I've had problems with mermaids too. Well, then maybe I'll learn something today. Um, you know, but to me, like she was talking about, they're just so weak and helpless. And I was like, I don't know, man, like these mermaids look, uh, you know, I don't know. They look like they could kill a sailor. Like it didn't seem to me like, like <laughs> sirens. Oh, sorry. And the point is like, that, you know, just they didn't see, I don't know, you know, to me, it didn't seem like it just wasn't anything I would have thought of. Um, I wouldn't look at a statue of a mermaid and just think, but I'm getting off point. The point is just that, yeah, you know, I didn't, um, you know, in the groups that I'm in that are like Weimar groups, like no one's ever posting a, like a, a picture of Anita Berber and being like, you know, heroin use is no joke. Like it's like, no one's, it just doesn't, it doesn't seem to happen. Now that I've said that, uh, I'm sure that these comments are going to erupt. Uh, I resent the Sasquatch. You must have some hairy toes then. I don't know what to tell you. Uh, I've been wondering if any of those materials are being suppressed or hidden or even worse, destroyed. You know what, man? This, the stuff was destroyed in its day. So like in Italy, when you had Mussolini take power, anything relating to the age of opulence, they destroyed. That's why so many of those great Italian Art Nouveau posters, there's only two, three copies of some things that are really important images. And then like important opera posters, things like that. Then you had the incredible future start. Well, then Mussolini fell out of power and they started burning that stuff because it reminded them of Mussolini. And that hurts great. So it's like, most of the, the book burning mentality happens when people are, as a large culture, a large swath of culture really charged up about something. If you've got, um, you know, people that have, you know, materials, like for example, like if you have a bunch of old Nazi paperwork or something like that, you know, there's a museum that's going to want that. Like someone's going to want to study it. Like the, the, I guess maybe the people that are really upset about these kind of things, like aren't smart enough to find it. You know what I mean? Like they're not going like to a used book store and saying, what do you have in the basement that could be offensive? Um, and so I, I don't, I don't see that happening. I, I was talking about this earlier today too that when I think about, I watched this video and it had some, some guy at a school board meeting and he was uh, reading a, a printed out sheet from a book that he was upset was in his child's school. And I was listening to it. And I'm like, that sounds really, really terrible. And so I looked up the book, I found it online, read the reviews, found a PDF, did all that. Nothing that he quoted was actually in the book. He grossly, grossly misrepresented it. And what it was is someone had effectively riled him up. And so when you think about the, the cancel culture ideology, it's, it is so deeply entrenched in the culture of people who live on the internet and in Twitter and in printing things out and not doing their own research. And so, uh, you know, when it comes to historical materials, it's the opposite. It's the people that really want to understand and know history. And so, yeah, no one's going to go buy like a bunch of old, you know, magazines with naked women in them from the 1930s and burn them. It's uh, it is a great question, but it is just kind of sociologically opposite to really what the ideology of each camp is the people that respect and can find the ephemera are usually fascinated by it. And the people that are infuriated by it love Twitter uh, and not libraries. Um, what time is it? It's 8.50, there's 10 minutes left. 
I still don't know what we're talking about tonight, but there's only 10 <laughs> minutes left to go. Uh, Chandra, is there anything else I should say? There's no mouse here. I don't even know how to do it. Uh, so we got a little behind on our Kickstarter stuff. Caligula was uh, super overwhelming. Um, I'm really proud of it. Obviously, premiering at the Cannes Film Festival makes the suffering worth it because it's like, okay, there's this stamp of approval and uh, the reviews were so good. The director of the festival sent me a really, really beautiful note um, about how grateful he was to have it at the festival. Like, I feel like that was worth it. The people who suffered, unfortunately, are the Kickstarter backers because we... I kept like, so, so the one that I, I literally just finished last night, I finished the last edit is beautiful macabre, which a lot of people I know were waiting for. And what happened is I kept, I, this is what, this is a regular thing with me. I was looking at, it, I'm like, I know it can be better. I know it can be better. And then there's the voice that's like, well, just put it out, just put it out. And I feel like, God, that's so disrespectful. Like to just put it out because I'm busy, it feels wrong. And so I appreciate everyone's patience. Um, we did discover last night that it went from 96 pages to 120 pages um, as a result of this. That's the other thing that happens when I do this is that the page count skyrockets. Um, so it's 120 pages. There's a ton of stuff in there that is not in the old one. Um, but the good news is now that's going to the printer. Um, and then the Caligula book, so now that Caligula is kind of in the festival circuit, I've been working on the documentary and I'm working on that book simultaneously. I don't have a date for when that book will be done, um, but it's happening. It's all happening now. That's really the big thing for me in the next two, three months is to wrap those things up before the fall premieres because I want those things to be in the world while Caligula is viewable uh, at the end of the year streaming. And then the new series that we're starting uh, in the next couple weeks, few weeks, as we are going to do a series uh, that is based on Yugend. And so the way that we did a series based on De Orchidine Garden, um, you can find these old magazines, you can find reprints of them, but the thing that they don't ever get into is when you're looking at these magazines, uh, they don't tell you who the artists are, they don't tell you their history, they don't tell you how they relate to each other or the movement. So the thing that we're doing that's a little different uh, is that I am going to be curating it. So instead of being every illustration like we did with the Orchid Garden, I'm going to just be picking the best ones, the ones that I feel are best, the most Art Nouveau leaning, the most mystical, the most romantic, the most um, illustrative in nature, meaning the artworks that, you know, like this is a great example. That's a great page. The artists that are the sensibilities that I believe would be most interesting to a contemporary illustrator. <laughs> How's that for a CD design? Um, and so, yeah, that's the next move is, uh, is going to be Jugend. Um, Jugend 1896 is going to be the first one. Uh, can you show us the pottery and the piano? There's all kinds of stuff. There's a, uh, there's a bat bowl. Uh, that's a whole other conversation. And I've got five minutes left. There we go. Uh, this one is Jolne. This is really interesting. One of the reasons I like um, some of the Art Nouveau pottery is that when you get into the really cool stuff like this, they remind me of psychedelic rock posters. They remind me of which is interesting, it's an interesting connection to Jugend, because Jugend, the German art is really what influenced the psychedelic poster movement. Um, and 
when you look at the the pottery that has those kind of iridescent glazes, psychedelic glazes, um, it does connect to kind of that otherworldly symbolism that, that we've talked about. And there's four minutes left. I guess I could, uh, I don't know what else I could talk about. See, I'm going to draw a blank though. I can't remember. I'm so, my head is not in it. Uh, and these won't, I don't think these will show up. I don't think you'll really be able to see what these are. I think that they'll kind of just seem boring on this line. I'd have to do more close-ups and stuff. I'm wearing a Caligula shirt that Kat designed that says, take my horse back to his own room. Uh, I'm hoping that we'll make some of these. I think that would be cool. Nice shirt, Kat says. Did she, did she say that before I said this or after? Simultaneous. Simultaneously. Um, but I think that's, that's it. Is there anything else I should say, Chandra? Thank you to everyone who backed the Chuckle Emporium Kickstarter. Those are shipping when? Uh, starting next week. Starting next week. That stuff's going to ship out. And so then it's just the, the, uh, yeah, it's just the two books that, that we're waiting on. And one will be in the print at the printer next week. Um, and then it'll just be that Caligula book, um, which again, like it's, it's, uh, it's long overdue, but it's one that's so important to me to do right. I want to make sure that it's really, like, I want to make sure that if I can identify anybody in a picture, I want to make sure that I'm doing it. I really want to be diligent about that. Um, it's getting to the point where I can tell in many cases, maybe a three day window when a picture might be. And a lot of people might say, well, I don't care about that. I just want to see the pictures. But it's like, ah, if I can, if I can really, even to the month, just say, okay, this was taken in July, 1976. I feel like it's important to, um, to, to do that work. And then the other thing is, um, you know, when you've got the movie and you've got the documentary and you've got the book, it just feels like it would be nice to not have redundancies. So one of the things I'm noticing is that when you're watching the film, you, you don't get to pull back as much as you'd like to uh, because of where the camera is placed. Um, and so, you know, there are, there are things that I want to do that really kind of enhance someone's viewing experience in terms of focusing on things that might have been in the movie uh, do we have shots that are kind of behind the scenes from those moments? So that'll be coming soon. Uh, and we'll talk about it on the next salon and all that stuff. But thank you guys so, so, so much. Thank you for everybody who commented. Even if I didn't mention your name, thank you guys. We appreciate you so much. And uh, uh, yeah, we just try to make sure that we're here every, first Thursday of every month. We'll see you next time. And if you haven't joined the Patreon, patreon.com slash Thomas the Govan is, is a really good place to be. Um, it's just a dollar for everything to just uh, try to have a hub to, to share images and, and uh, kind of behind the scenes things on the project. So, but thank you so much and we will see you next month.